Now we're moving on to the estimation part. And in, in this workshop, the foundations workshop, we will only uh, focus on maximum likelihood estimation. You should be aware that that's not the only way to proceed. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, the methods of moment estimation um, is very attractive for larger data sets because it is computationally simpler and asymptotically its properties, especially the optimal moments estimators, approach the properties of maximum likelihood. But this is something we'll uh, discuss in the Frontiers workshop. <coughs> First, I'll start with some uh, general notions, just a quick refresher of maximum likelihood estimation, and then some discussion of the asymptotics, which are very different in space from what you might be used to in standard econometrics. And then very quickly, because um, there's really no point in going into the derivations in great detail in, in this kind of um, framework, but I do want to focus on the essentials, and we'll do that probably this afternoon, the specifics of the spatial lag and the spatial error model. So to start with, um, what is the problem really? And we had a little bit of discussion about this yesterday, uh, the difference between the lag model and the error model. In the lag model, the real estimation problem is the fact that this spatially lagged variable is endogenous. It can be treated as an endogenous, or not treated, conceived as an endogenous variable. So the problem is how do we take this endogeneity into account? Um, we can use instruments. That's the methods of moments approach or instrumental variables approach. Or we can specify a complete model for the simultaneity, which is the maximum likelihood approach. So we set up a model with a distribution and a specification that includes the spatial lag in the model, and then we derive the estimates from that. The problem is very different for the spatial error situation, which, as we saw yesterday, is primarily a problem of precision. And this is simply a special case of what is referred to in econometrics as a non-spherical error variance matrix. Non-spherical meaning not being diagonal and not being constant term in the diagonal. So anything that is heteroscedastic and spatially correlated would be non-spherical. And a general solution to this is referred to as feasible generalized least squares. Generalized least squares is the principle, but in practice, in principle, for a known parameter in the error variance matrix, in practice, you don't know this parameter, this coefficient. You need to estimate it, which makes it a feasible generalized least square. So these are the two general approaches to the problem. Um, the conceptual framework is a very special one. And in the previous couple of days, I alluded to this in a, n a number of times, is this notion of stationarity. What I'd like to do here, before we move on to the actual estimation procedures, is to revisit this and make it slightly more formal and, and just make sure that you realize what all this is built on and, and what is really required to derive these kinds of estimators in a cross-sectional situation. Uh, the main problem is one that we have only one data point. The data point, the pattern, is the data point. And, and that, of course, doesn't work. You can't do estimation with a single data, with a single observation. So what we're going to do is cheat, as I like to put it, in that we're going to treat our pattern as if it consists of multiple data points. And the only way we can do this is if we assume so much structure that, in essence, it doesn't matter whether we see one realization of the pattern, which is the one that we have, or multiple realizations of the pattern. And as I mentioned yesterday, um, <coughs> the essence of this is that we assume that the system is stable so that we could think of multiple realizations of the pattern. And if we take one observation from each of these multiple realizations, 
and put them together, then the pattern of those realizations would be identical to that of the multiple realizations that we already saw. So for all practical purposes, then, we treat this as consisting of multiple observations, even though it's just one. And the notion that allows you to do this is uh, stationarity. And I like to use this illustration, which comes out of a, um, a geostatistics book, actually, a manual for software. But I think it is really a nice illustration of what I just said. If you have stationarity, then you can think of a, some process that generates maps. The process doesn't change. The maps change, but only slightly, because they only change because of the randomness. So then we observe, say, three different maps, if we could. right? These three different maps are all from the same structure. So then if we think of taking a slice out of the first map, and a slice out of the second map, and a slice out of the third map, and we put those together, then that map is still representative of the process that generates all these different generalization, gen realizations because of the stationarity, because of the equilibrium that we have assumed. It's like if you draw random numbers. So let's say you generate 100 standard normal random variables. Okay. You generate three sets. If you take you know, 20 out of the first set, and 30 out of the second set, and 50 out of the third set, and you put them together, they're still standard random normal variants, because the system is stable. It's the same rationale, but here applied to the whole map, to the whole pattern. Now, how do we operationalize this? Because this is just an abstraction. We operationalize it by imposing constraints on, on the statistical framework. And we impose, specifically, we like to impose constraints that are verifiable. Constraints on the distribution are conceptual and really cannot be verified. But constraints on moments can, to some extent, be verified. As we discussed the other day, if you assume that the mean is constant, what you could do is put a moving window over the data and compute the mean and see whether the mean is in fact stable within the randomness allowed by the, by the data, by the randomness of the data. And you could do something similar for the variance. You could do sim something similar for covariance. Basically what you want is that these moments are regular over space. So there's a limit on the degree of variability that you can have. There's a limit on the degree of spatial dependence that you can have. Specifically, and this comes back to what we said the first day, you have to have a distance decay so that the spatial correlation decreases with distance. The range of dependence is limited. And the rationale here is that as the sample grows, as we go to the limit, we gain information because these observations that are far enough apart are for all practical purposes uncorrelated or independent. And then we're back in our standard framework of independent observations. It's only going to take us a little longer to get there because we have to have sufficient observations to gain the information from these uh, pseudo uncorrelated observations. But the bottom line is that we have to restrict the kinds of models that we can analyze in this framework. And it's intuitively, it should be obvious, if you're only working with a single cross-section, you cannot really analyze a highly dynamic, constantly changing system, because your one single snapshot of that system is totally unrepresentative of what is actually going on. You're just looking at it at one particular time, but the next moment it could be totally different. So you can't have that. So this is only appropriate in situations where you can actually reasonably think of the outcome as being in some sort of equilibrium. Now, that's never actually the case, but you know it's got to be close enough. And so if you're looking at income distribution or uh, phenomena like that that take a long time to change, then this is a reasonable assumption. 
If you're looking at the stock market that changes by the second, this is not a reasonable assumption. So these are the kinds of things to keep in mind in actual applied work. There are a couple of concepts here that you will see in the literature that um, I just want to spend a second explaining. This concept of ergodicity is essentially yet another way of, of making sure that your single, your single data point, your pattern, can actually be treated as consisting of multiple pseudo observations, if you wish. In, in the following sense that whether you look at that single map that you actually have or if you had the luxury of looking at multiple maps all generated by the same process, the summary statistics would be the same. And that's in essence what this is about. So if that is the case, then in fact whether you compute the average over the one map that you have or you computed it over the multiple realizations that you don't have, it would be the same average. That's basically an, a constraint that you put on the analysis. Strict stationarity then it pertains to the full distribution as an, is, and is essentially not verifiable because a distribution is something you don't actually see. It's a mathematical concept. You can do an, um, see and compute an empirical distribution function, a histogram or a density function, but that's not the same thing. That's just a measure of the data. It's not the actual concept that you use. So what we do is we first define this conceptually in terms of the distribution and then operationalize it in terms of characteristics of the distribution that we can actually estimate, specifically the moments like a mean and a variance and a spatial correlation. In concept, stationarity means that the joint distribution of any data points remains the same no matter where you are in the data set. So you can think of a joint distribution of, say, any 10 data points within a window. That distribution should not change if you move the window over. It's the same distribution. Now this, as I said, is not verifiable. What you can verify is whether the characteristics of that distribution remain the same. And so typically, what we refer to is not strict st stationarity, but what is referred to as moment stationarity, whether the moments are invariant under spatial shift. And so what that means specifically for the mean is that there is no trend. Now, in most of our applications, the mean is not constant. That's what makes things interesting. So then, how do we deal with this? As I mentioned the other day, we put some structure for the mean, like in a regression model, and then what's left, the error term, is constant mean, because it's zero mean. So these things always have to be put into perspective. The raw data will almost never satisfy this. Because raw data that satisfies this is not interesting. Right? If the mean is the same everywhere, you know, you're looking at a constant. That's not anything. The interest in statistical analysis is in variability. It's the variance. That's what gives you the information. Things are different, so therefore you can start doing what-if comparisons. What happens if this is high and that is low, do we get the same thing on the left-hand side? But if everything is the same everywhere, nothing varies, there's very little information to be gained. So the interesting models are models where you put the structure in for these means, and then what's left is zero mean, so that satisfies the stationarity. Same for variance and variability. Now you may be able to make an assumption that after you've controlled for this mean, the conditional mean typically in a regression, that the remainder has a constant variance. That's an assumption. But often in practice that is not satisfied. So then again you need to push it a little further. You need a model for the variability. After the model for the variability, what remains should be constant variance. And similarly for the covariance, the spatial covariance,
should not be a function of location. We talked about this already the other day, and in that it doesn't matter where you are for the spatial covariance. What matters is what your neighbors are or how far you are away from other distributions. The neighbor concept is embedded directly in the spatial weights matrix. The distances can be either used in a geostatistical analysis or also in the weights matrix. But the essence is the strength of the spatial autocorrelation should be the same everywhere on the map. And so this was a motivation the other day of looking at the local spatial autocorrelation as a potential diagnostic. If the local spatial autocorrelation is very different in subsets of the data, that suggests that this assumption of stationarity is not satisfied. And then we have to model this by bringing in structural change, which is something we'll talk about tomorrow. So each of these are to some extent verifiable, and that's the good thing about them. The distribution, the strict assumption of stationarity is really not verifiable. Uh, it is something you use in derivations and, and in theory. So with this stationarity in hand, we can move to maximum likelihood estimation. And the principle is fairly straightforward. You specify a full model. That full model has a joint density function, which is a function of the data and of parameters. And you find the parameter values that give you the highest possible joint probability given the data. So it becomes a maximization problem. Find me the highest probability that these data are generated by a distribution with these particular parameters. And you can think of this intuitively. Let's say I'm trying to model the height distribution of the people in this class. And I'm going to assume, this is maximum likelihood, that it follows a normal distribution. A normal distribution is fully characterized by two, two um, moments, the mean and the variance. Okay. And let's say I, have, I can compute a multivariate normal distribution, and I can compute the joint probability of that, uh, but I need these parameters. Well, let's, let's say I'm sticking a given average height and a given uh, variance, and given the data of the heights in the class, I come up with a joint probability and say, just for the sake of the example, that probability is 0.8. You know, probabilities are between 0 and 1. So then I change the parameters. I take a little higher height, and I do this again, and I get 0.81. Well, 0.81 is a higher probability than 0.8. So I keep going, and of course, we're not going to just randomly sticking numbers, there will be an actual optimization process, but the rationale, the intuition is that we keep plugging in parameter values and finding what the joint probability is, and when we find the highest possible value for the data that we observe, we stop. And those parameter values are then the maximum likelihood estimates. And that's, in a nutshell, what it is about. In practice, about of course, it becomes a very mathematical exercise because we have to mathematically write out what this likelihood function is and then we have to find the maximum. If we're lucky we use first order conditions which are first partial derivatives and we can solve them and we're done. In practice it doesn't work that way and we have to use numerical approaches to actually maximize the likelihood. The analytical approaches don't work. So, um, as I mentioned, the, the principle is we, s we spell out the likelihood function. How do we find the maximum? We have the first order conditions. These are the first partial derivatives of the log likelihood. This is also called the score, the same score that we used in the score test. Um, so, we solve these and then we find the maximum. The, as it turns out, to make a long story short, the asymptotic variance of these estimates can be obtained from the what is called the information matrix which is built up from the second partial derivative. So uh, 
this becomes a very highly uh, complex mathematical exercise. If we're lucky, we can actually compute these second order partial derivatives, but there's no guarantee at all that we can do that. And for some, for a lot of models, actually for many of the more interesting models, we have to resort to numerical methods to approximate <laughs> these um, second partial derivatives and as a result to approximate the asymptotic variance matrix. Once we do this, we're in business. This is the best possible of all worlds. We have consistency, which means that in the limit, we reach the um, correct value of the parameter. We have asymptotic normality, which is um, not what it sounds like. This doesn't mean that we have normality in the limit, because we don't. In the limit, we have no distribution. It's degenerate. In the limit, we have the exact value of the parameters, so nothing changes anymore. There's no randomness. So that in and of itself is not useful to carry out inference. So what we do instead is we rescale the parameter estimate. In fact, we rescale the difference between the true value and the parameter estimate. And this is this square root of n that you see in many textbooks. And this rescaled thing, then under the proper conditions, has a normal distribution. And that's what we call um, the asymptotic normality. That's what the asymptotic normality refers to. Because in the limit, you don't have a distribution. So to get something that behaves like a distribution, we do this rescaling typically by the square root of n, where n is the sample size, which then gets us a distribution that we can use for inference. Now the question still remains, if we have a hugely large data set, and we are for all practical purposes in the limit, then this doesn't work anymore either, because then we're stuck. We are at, at the limited value. And this is something you run into as, uh, depending on, on the kind of model and the kind of method you use, but you do run into this when you use, when you apply methods to very, very large, millions of observations. The variance is essentially disappeared. There is no more variance, so everything is significant because, in effect, you have so much information that you don't have to rely on statistical inference. Just pure differences are good enough to tell you the, the notion of significance disappears because there is no more variability. Um, and this is something that we have to think about as we move to larger and larger data set. The other um, nice property is asymptotic efficiency, which means that this is the best you can do in terms of precision. But it's important to keep this into perspective. This is only so if indeed all the assumptions that you put into the likelihood are correct. Of course, when they're not correct, things are not going to be as good as in this perfect situation. But if everything is correct, then maximum likelihood is the best you can do in terms of efficiency. That doesn't mean that other methods, specifically an optimal generalized methods of moments method, can also achieve the same variance bound. But uh, maximum likelihood achieves it. Other methods do not necessarily achieve it. For example, a standard GMM does not. An optimal GMM does, but very often you can't get an optimal GMM, so then you can't achieve this. The invariance property is something that's a little more subtle. It means that you can use the estimates in functions as if you had the true parameters in functions. And this is important when you use this in policy analysis. Uh, for example, in, in, in finite uh, sample analysis, we know that the expected value of a function of the random variable is not the function of the expected value of the random variable. The expected value of the square of a random variable is not the square of the, the mean of the expected value of the random variable. But in the limit, with maximum likelihood, because you are working in the limit, you can just plug it in. 
So you can plug in these estimates in functional forms as if you plugged in the true value. And this is something that comes in handy in when you say compute elasticities or other functions that are functions of the parameters, you can just plug in the estimates because you're working in the limit. This also comes in handy in lots of proofs that which we won't get into, but it is the same idea. In the limit you can act you can use the estimate as if it was the true parameter value, which is very handy. <coughs> now we get into the difficult domain. Uh, the maximum likelihood is this cl classic textbook derivation is for independent, identically distributed observations. The moment you introduce spatial dependence, there are several complications that arise. As we saw the other day, yesterday, several of these spatial models in, induce heteroskedasticity. Heteroskedasticity violates constant variance, which is the stationarity that we had. So then we have to start from scratch. A lot of the classical results do not hold in the presence of spatial correlations. So we need uh, 